Welcome back into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I am your co-host, Scott Bernstein, along with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, the Dr. Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. Hey, now. And behind the glass, we got our producer extraordinaire, Benito Agosta, Benny Agosta. Hola. Who is uh, <laughs> really the the MVP of the summer of 2022. Yes. Um, this week, we're going to discuss some real-time mob murder news that is a uh, combination of old school and new school. Um, if you've been paying attention to the news out of Las Vegas, there have been bodies that have been popping up in uh, Lake Mead, which is the, the largest um, reservoir in the United States. It's the biggest body of water in Nevada. And it's been a place um, that just like the desert in Las Vegas, where there's been a lot of problems solved, uh, the bottom of Lake Mead uh, ha has solved a lot of problems, and uh, some of those problems uh, were were mob related and tied into the very bloody, um, high profile, off the rails reign of Tony the Ant Spilatro, who uh, ran the Vegas underworld from the early 70s till he was murdered in 1986. And then you had a, uh, an entire movie based on, on his, uh, his maniacal <laughs> run atop the rackets and in the desert, uh, the movie Casino with Joe Pesci uh, playing a character based on Spilatro. So starting in May, uh, bodies began to emerge from Lake Mead. There's a drastic dip in water level. Yeah, drought. And uh, first it's really crisis level at this yeah. point. First body um, was found on May 1st, and the most recent body was found this week, um, second week of August. And uh, there are five specific cold case mob murders that the FBI in, in, in Las Vegas, as well as the LA sorry, the LVPD and Clark Clark County sheriffs are um, doing a kind of a drill down on, going back over these missing person cases that they believe were mob hits and trying to connect uh, these victims to potentially to the bodies that they have found. So Family Affair, uh, Greed, Treachery, and Betrayal in the Chicago Mafia was my book. I covered... The 2007 Operation Family Secrets trial, um, the biggest prosecution of organized crime figures, mafia figures uh, in, in the Chicago area. And the reason that's tied to Las Vegas is because Tony Spilatro, who's the guy we'll be talking about in this episode, the, the mob boss of Las Vegas, Joe Pesci in the movie Casino, uh, came from Chicago and was sent to Las Vegas by the Mafia Dons in Chicago to look after um, a series of investments made by a consortium, if you will, of Midwest Mafia families into the Las Vegas hotel and gaming industry. And Spilatro had proven himself quite capable. Um, he, he, he was a little guy, uh, about 5'4", uh, but very, very ferocious and very, very lethal. Uh, probably had two dozen bodies um, to his credit when he left for Las Vegas in 1971. And when he eventually was killed in 1986, uh, authorities were, were connecting, you know, maybe th three dozen gangland hits in, in those uh, 15 years. So, so what year did he go out there? Went out in 71 and was killed in June of 86. So he's going out there, correct me if, this, if I'm wrong, he's going out there to if we're going to be more specific, to protect the skim and protect outfit controlled casinos from other, because there were other yeah, so wise guys out there. So there's, like I said, it was more of like a, a cons, it was like a mob consortium. Yeah. The Chicago mob was at, you know, the, the apex of that power pyramid. But you had crime families representing Cleveland, Detroit, Milwaukee, Kansas City, St. Louis, um, that were all knee deep in, in Vegas gaming industry investments. And 
Chicago being, um, you know, the the biggest family of all those families and uh, the one with the most interests uh, wanted their own guy there. And they had had their own guy there before, a guy named Marshall Cofano, uh, Johnny Shoes, who was just, I, I guess it, it's somewhat ironic that they moved him out of Vegas because he was being too um, camera friendly and uh, they thought that he was too high profile. Too high profile. And they bring Spilatro in to replace him. And if you were if you thought that Marshall Cofano was being high profile in the sixties, yeah. it, it's it's it, it's on a different planet than the type of high profile behavior that Spilatro was exhibiting um in the seventies and eighties. So you didn't really solve the problem and actually in actuality you made the problem a lot worse. And Ben, have you you've seen Casino, right? Oh, of course, yeah. Great. So when I, I mean, when I we talk about protecting the skim, I know it's it's one of Scott, me and Scott's favorite scenes. But the, the reason we have to protect the skim is because the, the guys on the inside who are running the skim will skim from right. the mafia. <laughs> when they say it in the movie, they're like, "You can't expect if you're." Uh, I think I don't remember if it was the voiceover by Pesci or if it was the the guy that they were holding responsible, but they said, you can't expect the higher guys to steal for you, from, for you and not, not expect them to steal from you. Right, <laughs> right. So, yeah, keep an eye on the guys who are... <laughs> yeah, and then the, the mafia guy says, are you telling me that... Uh, or no, he says, are you telling me that we're being ripped off by our own guys? And then the guy responds, like, yeah, it's called leakage. And he says, yeah. "Leakage my balls. I want my money." <laughs> yeah. So he, the I I think it's I think he says, uh, "You mean the money we're stealing? They're stealing from mm -hmm. us." Right. <laughs> so that I mean I, I I imagine I mean I read your book, but it was a while ago, and I read uh, Casino too from uh, uh, Pelleggi a long time ago. But I, I imagine that was one of the main reasons to go out there was to keep an eye on the skim. Well, that was the biggest racket of them all. Yeah. Uh, was the fact that they had easy. And total access to about a half dozen casinos count rooms. Right. And the count room is just what it sounds like. It was a giant room without any windows where all the cash from the previous, you know, four or five hours of gambling activity were were were, were funneled into and then counted and taken <laughs> into a bank or a vault. And when the mob had unfettered access. So they were just in there grabbing with, with both hands right. and every so then, day. So then Spilatro goes out there and he realizes all we're doing is the skim. Like I can come out here. Yeah. I can sell drugs. I can loan shark. I can get into, uh, you know, theft. I can run backdoor casinos <laughs> back for people that, casino. for people that don't want to go to the real casinos. We'll give them better <laughs> odds and we can be the loan sharks. They go to when they need right, the money. Right. So he realizes there, there's a lot of money to be made there that they're not on even, the street, on the streets that they're not even capitalizing. They have nothing on. to do with what's going on in the casinos. Right. Um, and this was part of the, the, um, insubordinate behavior or when it started, uh, and when, I mean, he started to go off the rails really quickly and, and he had a 15 year run. So, I mean, it shows you how, um, what a three ring circus that, that, uh, his, his regime was in Vegas. Uh, and then you add in the fact, and this is a, a part of the story that I don't feel like has gotten anywhere near the level of chatter that it that it needs to, to to put everything in context. It's referenced in Casino, but it, throw in the the word cocaine and the fact that cocaine was booming uh, around the country in the late seventies, early eighties, and Spilatro and everyone around Spilatro were indulging, and these weren't young guys; these were guys in you know in their 40s and 50s and 60s. And Spilatro got, I don't know if it was a full-fledged addiction, but a lot of what Spilatro was doing was <laughs> was being guided, in, in my mind, in my research, by the fact that he was stoned uh, a big chunk of the time. And, and when you're a lunatic and you start doing cocaine, you become more of a lunatic. So he was making uh, bad decisions, yeah, l largely, or at least part of it was just how he was wired, but but part of it was probably substance, right? And then you saw abuse. also in the movie, and then, uh, let me uh, make very clear that 
I can sit here and Jimmy and I can sit here and we could critique Marty Scorsese for what he did in The Irishman, but in terms of taking creative license and veering off from you know, reality to almost straight fiction, Goodfellas and Casino were the opposite of that. They st stuck mostly to what really happened. And what you saw in Casino, the behavior that Joe Pesci was portraying um, might not have really even been doing it justice. Um, and you had a situation where Joe Pesci's character in the movie Nicky Santoro in real life, Tony Spilatro, starts sleeping with the wife of a very valuable mob associate that was the inside guy uh, in the movie he's called Ace Rothstein in real life he was Lefty Rosenthal uh, he was running the inside for the mob he was, I mean it was probably the most important cog in that entire wheel because he was the boots on the ground the day to day overseer of all of that from the inside and Spilatro uh, it, it was a guy that he was friends with from the, when they were kids and they have some giant pissing contest that ends up with Splatro trying to show Rosenthal who's really boss and he and he starts sleeping with his wife and 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 wasn't very quiet about it. And that didn't go over well with the especially the old timers yeah. in back in Chicago. The little guy, he wouldn't be fucking the Jew's wife, would he? <laughs> Cuz yeah. if he is, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. And and we've talked to some people on air who knew him and we we've talked to a a guy off the record, a made guy by the way, Scott and I have met with who was close with Splatro, and they'll all tell you, "Oh, that was just that was just Hollywood." Uh, he was really a chill he's guy. A he's, he's, he's a sweetheart. He's a sweetheart. And I think that, that you know it's all relative, right? Like if you're if you're his boy and you're with him on a day to day basis, yeah, you probably don't see this. You don't. You're not. You don't see it the same way <laughs> that someone else, you know, from the outside who's a more well adjusted non gangster, you know, a civilian. Uh, so it's just it's just kind of interesting. You're gonna sit here and tell me that you didn't gamble that money, and that's why your lights got turned off. That's why your oh, power that's, got that's turned one off. Of the you're gonna come scenes. here and you're gonna tell me that. <laughs> that that's don't make a fuck out don't of me. me. Don't make a fool out of me. <laughs> that's a, that's one of the best. If I find out too. that you're gambling, I'll leave you where I find you. I, I, you know, actually, like I, I think that Goodfellas is a better movie. But in terms of scenes that I like to recall and rewatch and that make me like amuse me, Casino has, I think has more like memorable, if that makes sense. In its totality, I think Goodfellas is better. But but like in terms of like those kinds of like scenes. What kind of man are you? Yeah. Your wife comes and tells Frankie you can't put the freaking power on because you're out gambling. Yeah. Fucking paycheck away. Just, and and uh, what like, kind of man are you? De Niro sits down with James Woods. That's right. another funny. Don't be a pimp. <laughs> Well, that, again, that's another that was <laughs> not diamond. <laughs> that wasn't exaggerated. That wasn't um, you know created for the sake of the film. All of those relationships, the way they were portrayed, were very accurate. The in the movie, her name was Ginger. In real life, it was Jerry. She was this you know Vegas casino hustler slash high high end escort. Um, that had a childhood boyfriend that that kind of shadowed her the rest of her life while she was out there um, hustling and and you know on the move. She would always kind of take care of this guy. His name wasn't Lester Diamond; it was a similar name. Um, <laughs> and he tried, and just like in the movie, this guy when when she gets her hooks into. Uh, the Chicago mob and, and Rosenthal and Spilatro, this guy comes in and tries to leech off it. Yeah. He says, and he's lucky he didn't, and he, he's lucky he didn't end up in a Did he tell you not to do it? Right. No. He says, fuck him. Take him for everything he's got. <laughs> and then, uh, excuse me, aren't you the, or what does he say? Correct me if I'm wrong. Aren't you the card shark, golf hustler, <laughs> Beverly <Lester> Hills Pimp? <laughs> and then, and then when, when James Wood is walking away, he's like, fucking bullshit. <laughs> He kick his ass in the in the parking lot. So it, it's a really, I mean, that's a great movie, and it, it's it's a really interesting, you know, period to to research. A lot of colorful characters, but I mean, it's obvious that he was a violent dude. So if these bodies are uh, you know, emerging in Lake Mead, it's a drought crisis level. So. I mean, how are they finding these bodies? I mean, are they like they're beached? They're just beached, or are they like out there walking around, like scooping up fucking uh, no, like, mud and stuff? I mean, I, I'm not really researched yeah, they're, this. They're, 
they're beached, but encased in mud. Okay. Uh, you know, the first body was found um, encased in a barrel. Uh, the second body was found with two bullet holes in the back of the skull. Um, the last two that have been found in the last 10 days were found off of a swimming pier um, uh, at, at a place within Lake Mead called Hemingway Harbor. Um, I think this is also a way for us to kind of draw to draw a through line from what's happening in 2022 and these bodies emerging and then back to the film and some of the characters that you saw in the movie um, are now playing a role in this modern day narrative, specifically when it comes to the skim. So one of the first, if not the first name that started to be circulated as one of these, uh, the owner of of these, these sets of remains that have been found uh, is a guy named, or was a guy named Jay Vandermark, who was the Chicago mob's skim captain. Um, in the movie, they changed his, his name to John Nance, but he he has a couple pretty big scenes in the movie. He was the one that was we were recounting the the the, the scene where they're talking about the the people that are stealing in the count room. He's the guy that's explaining it to the mob guys. He's the one that says it's called leakage. Yeah. Uh, How does he get killed in the movie? I don't remember. So in the movie, they show you that, uh, and this was a little bit of dramatic license. They they show you that he took off after um, the casino was raided. Now that part's true. Uh, casino is raided uh the five casinos that were underneath the chicago mob banner were raided uh, in the summer of 1976 and within a couple weeks you had two members of the splatro crew uh show up missing one of them being jay vandermark who was the person that was in charge of the skim and who the fbi was looking to interview and he had left town the day that the, the, the raid had happened. Um, so in the movie, they show you uh, some unnamed hitman uh, track him down in Costa Rica. Oh, right. They shoot, and him, they in the shoot him in the pool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's Nance. Okay. Uh, that's but the Nance that's, character. That's not what really happened. In reality, he, he vanished. And then they took another situation that happened where someone got killed in their pool and they I just see. they just put him together. I see. The so guy they, got pulled in his, the guy that got killed in his pool was a guy named Jerry Lisner, a l- listener who had nothing to do with any of this. And I'm assuming they thought that this guy was going to snitch. Yeah, so the they FBI. thought that Vandermark was going to um give them up and then they also reference this in the movie. They say that uh John Nance took off for Costa Rica and you know this is like Joe Pesci narrating it. And we thought that he was going to uh because his kid was all strung out on drugs uh, yeah. to save his kid, he's going to give us all up and, and him and his kid are going to disappear into witness protection. Um, and, and that played a role in some of the um, mindset in, in wanting to get rid of Vandermark. And then Vandermark's son, Jeff, who was a, a drug addled, ended up being killed uh, in the months after that. And that wasn't a missing person. He, they no, found they his- found him in, uh, in his apartment in, in Las Vegas. And he was a drug dealer? Drug dealer, drug addict, both. Uh, but Vandermark just disappeared. He left Las Vegas. He was last seen in Arizona hanging out with. Um, so we should let people know that when Spilatro got sent out to Las Vegas in 1971, not only did he he see this kind of new frontier with you know, they've only been worried about the inside all these years. I'm going to start worrying about the outside. He also got ambitious and said, well, why, why do I, why do I have to be hemmed in to Las Vegas? I can set up crews in LA and in San Diego and in Phoenix. So, you know, he set up um, satellite operations with, uh, you know, placing one of his loyalists in each one of those um, cities, and they're already outfit guys in Phoenix. Did they? Did they bump heads? Spilatro seems to be not like a very delicate diplomatic right. guy. It wouldn't surprise me if <laughs> some of his guys. He had his guy Paulie Shiro out there. They called him Paulie the Indian. Oh yeah, and yeah, heard, uh, that sounds familiar. That's who Vandermark was last seen with. Okay, was with the um, the Arizona Spilatro crew, and he was at one of their um, 
nightclubs or restaurants. So he clearly felt safe. He yeah. felt comfortable. He was he was running from the 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 cops. Ostensibly, not- he was running from the cops, and I think he thought that the mob was going to help hide him. And in right. and in reality, the mob killed him. So he's he's someone that they suspect, authorities suspect, is one of these that, bodies. Yeah. So that was the first name that started to really get traction when people were playing the guessing game on on who who these bodies belong to. Um, so he vanished on August first, seventy six. Um, fast forward two and a half weeks, August eighteenth. Another member of the Salato crew uh, from Chicago. Uh, his name was John. Panagio Tacos was Greek, but he went by the, um, I don't want to say it was a nickname. I think it was more of like a um, uh, alias. Uh, He went by Johnny Pappas. And Pappas had come out to Las Vegas in the early 70s, started to work at a lot of the uh, mob-owned casinos as a pit boss, as a manager. Uh, He was also from my research, heavily involved in Democratic Party politics out in Nevada between uh, the late 60s and and when he vanished in 76. Uh, And then in 74, he was given a very plum job. They gave him control of a ritzy Teamsters funded casino and resort that actually rested on Lake Mead. It was called the Echo Bay Resort. And Pappas was in charge of the Echo Bay Resort. And according to um, law enforcement informant files, he was dabbling in quite a few uh, illicit activities, helping skim money, steal money. And uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that two guys disappeared in the weeks after the FBI raids five of the mob owned casinos. And so Pappas disappeared on August 18th on his way to a restaurant called Jojo's to what he, he was going to a meeting where he thought he was going to be uh, discussing selling his boat. So those are two of the top candidates. So those were the two names that first surfaced. Um, Then you started to hear about a drug dealer named William Crespo, who went by the nickname Billy Bahama, and he was a Cuban. And this now is moving into the 80s. So uh, both Pappas and Vandermark disappear August of 76. This is uh, 82, uh, winter of 82 into 83. And Billy Crespo... And this is this is a part of the story I didn't really know, although it doesn't surprise me. Crespo was a courier for skim money. But unlike the other couriers that would be going back and forth between Las Vegas and the Midwest and dropping money off in Milwaukee, Kansas City, Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago, there were other couriers that were going south and, and investing skim money into drug deals. So Crespo... Uh, Wait a minute. Sorry to interrupt. They're freelancing, like skimming from the skim, or they're doing I, this I on behalf of I, connected I, I, I can't, guys? I can't speak to that. Because I, we I, know, I mean, mafia guys, this goes back to something we've talked about a lot, the, the so-called prohibition on, on drugs. We know, and that might come from the top, but we know that individual-made guys put money on the streets, right. and sometimes it's financing right. drug deals. Uh, see, again, I don't know. I never heard of Billy Crespo before uh, a couple months ago. I didn't know anything about casino skim money being sent down to Miami and put into the cocaine market. Um, and in some ways, I think they were washing the money and bringing it back cleaner. I don't know exactly how. but Well, there was, sure, a lot of real estate. Yeah. There was a real estate boom at that time because of all the cocaine money. So Crespo was back and forth between Miami, Chicago, Vegas. Uh, it was kind of going like, on a regular basis, was taking the trip between all three of those cities. And uh, he got, I think it was 
holidays, 1982, in between in between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and he got nailed coming uh, on a plane. Excuse me, he got nailed coming on a plane from Miami to McCarran Airport, which is the uh, airport in Las Vegas, and uh, they caught him with uh, dr drugs and cash. Um, I think it was about fifty thousand dollars and uh, uh, some kilos of cocaine. And they think, so this could be gangland related, but not necessarily outfit Well, related. he was, the, the police and, and feds tie Crespo to Spilatro. Okay. Now, none, again, we don't know, we don't know, you know, particulars on any of, you know. Yeah. We, we have a lot of speculation, a lot of innuendo, a lot of educated guesses, but we don't have bodies. Or, or we might be able to. They're link not up, connected yet, but though. We, but, but we have matched yet, right? So um, uh, there's a lot of conjecture. So Crespo flips and agrees to give the feds um, information on money laundering and Teamster uh, pension fund fraud. Oh, and, oh, he did agree. Like that's yeah, he known. Flipped. He flipped, okay, and okay. he was about to testify in a case against some. Uh, mobbed up casino execs in the summer of 83 and he disappeared a couple of weeks before that and then the case fell apart. I wonder what happened. I wonder if he, I mean, he should have been protected at that point. I wonder what he, like, did he, you know how those guys, they go back and forth. Sometimes they decide that Fuck it! I'm not going to cooperate. <laughs> I'm just going to go like and sometimes go they want to run they, or something. They want to play. They want to play both sides Th of the fence. Right, yeah, they want to be on the outside right. and pretending that they're you still know, a gangster, as <laughs> as clean as a whistle. Yeah, but in reality, they're they're meeting and and planning and uh, coordinating with the government to yeah. a cooperate and then b eventually disappear into yeah. witness protection. Yeah, I mean, we saw that with um, Big Pussy and The Sopranos. Yeah. Remember, he was. Sometimes he thought he was like undercover secret yeah. agent, but then sometimes he's like, I, I kind of like being a gangster. I'm just going to keep on doing yeah, that. There's too. a lot of gray there. Uh, the, the cooperators and the deals that they're making and what they're allowed to do or they're not allowed to do. I mean, it reaches all the way. We've talked about it with Whitey Bulger and, and Greg Scarpa. That, that's the highest level of um, <laughs> chicanery. I mean, I don't know. Uh, where, where you have duplicity, where you have cooperators that are given a license to kill. Because of the operation, or because of the cooperation they're giving over years and years, and and they they operate with impunity, um, but I think there are all different layers and levels to that. Where you know guys that might on paper look like they're playing for Team USA, yeah, you know, maybe they are when it's beneficial to them, but they're not when it's not beneficial to them. Yeah, but if the wrong people find out, they'll they'll right. kill it, them in a second, right? You know. Oh, and the and that's why it's a a tightrope act because when the government finds out that you're doing yeah. illegal activity after you've cut your deal, yeah. your deal is thrown out the window. Yeah, unless it's corrupt FBI unless office it's a in corrupt Boston FBI agency. <laughs> or New York, <laughs> right? But but right with even Scarpa, though uh, right. <laughs> um, um, Devecchio got acquitted. But. Yeah, but but theoretically, right? That's what just happened. So. Um, are there any other suspects? I yeah, mean, so, I mean, uh, so there are, not suspects, but um, so there's five potential five homicide, five homicide probes. Um, we just went through three. Uh, the last two, one we have a name, and the other, the final one, we don't. So, uh, 1977, a guy named Bobby Shaw, who was a member of Spilatro's LA, um, crew, I guess you could say. I think he was back and forth between LA and Vegas. Uh, drugs, burglary, um, collections. And uh, he um, he disappeared uh, May of 77 on his way from, he had gone to LA to handle some business and then stopped to see his family. I believe he was at a family uh, dinner in Fontana, uh, California, which is in San Bernardino, San Bernardino, San Bernardino County, and um, kissed his uh, family goodbye and ne never made it to Vegas where he was supposed to show up uh, the next day. 
Well, one takeaway I have from this, see what you guys think. I know I know we uh this episode might not be as long as some of our others, but uh, we have to wrap up soon, but all of these guys, none of these guys are Italian. None of these guys are made guys. So when like the shit gets when the shit hits the fan, if you're not a made guy, you're not Italian. You're the first on the chopping block. Mm-hmm. You notice that? Like yep. I mean, you like when they're ready to clean house, you know, if you're a made guy, that becomes more complicated. You got to get, you got to get permission. More, more clearance. You got right. You got to go through the protocols and, and get. But like, if it's just some motherfucker who's who's Greek or Irish or whatever, a Cuban, a this, Cuban, yeah, right. They'll. I mean, and and you're then it's Gali Spilatro. It's just, uh, you know, so Bobby the Shaw, guillotine, man. We we can tie Bobby Shaw to, or I can tie Bobby Shaw to Joey Hansen, who was. Spilatro's L.A. lieutenant, and Joey Hansen was very dangerous, just like Spilatro grew up in Chicago, uh, but he wasn't Italian, um, but gained the trust of outfit bosses in Chicago because of the amount of alleged murders that he was involved in at a young age. Um, And that's why he was given control of L.A. I think uh, there were some discussions early on that they didn't want a non-Italian as a crew boss out there. And Spilatro got that taken care of and smoothed over. And Joey Hansen was this guy out there. Bobby Shaw used to run with Joey Hansen. Hansen was also a character in the movie Casino, but they changed his name to Jack Hardy. Um, But that the Jack Hardy character was supposed to be Joey Hansen. And, um, Hansen was a suspect in a massacre that took place like two months after Bobby Shaw disappeared in Chicago. It was a a, a bookie uh, office in Park Ridge, Illinois, where uh, four bookies got killed execution style. That sounds like this. The trait kind of sounded like we did the, the episode yeah, from this was seventy seven in Chicago. Yeah, we're talking about an incident in Detroit in eighty five, right? Where they killed three guys, yeah. two bookies, and one guy that just happened to be there to collect bets and was right. at the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, this was four bookies that either were stealing from the Chicago mob or talking about going off on their own. But Joey Hansen's considered uh, or when he when Joey Hansen died of cancer, I believe in 03, he was still considered the top suspect in that Park Ridge um, massacre. And again, in the timeline of this, Bobby Shaw disappeared uh, like seven weeks before that. Well, it's it's believable to me that they would make that decision for him in L.A., just like Lefty Rosenthal in Vegas. The outfit is a lot traditionally a lot less uptight, uh, and the Detroit too, a lot less uptight about – like New York to me, it's unimaginable that they would put a non-Italian – in that in that level of the hierarchy, I mean, they had a Greek in San Diego, Chris Petty. Yeah, right. So to me, that that seems like standard operating procedure for the outfit. Especially, and they were, sen- and they were sending uh, part of the um, outside rackets, if you will, in, in Las Vegas: drugs, gambling, extortion, prostitution, burglary. And the Chicago mob has always been a, a group that's been heavy, heavy in in the burglary rackets, more so than I think any other crime yeah, family. Yeah, I think so too. And um, they would burglarize these uh, high rollers, uh, their places, not just their residence, uh, re- not not just residential neighborhoods, but they would get tip offs to where they were staying in hotels and get access to those hotel rooms and they'd go into the city. Anyway, they needed places to fence these these stolen goods. Yeah. And they needed places that weren't in Nevada. So I, these these uh Arizona crew, the Arizona crew and the Lo, uh, and the Los Angeles crew were very uh integral to those uh fencing operations. And you can see here how that would get Spilatro in trouble with some of the higher ups in Chicago, because obviously they're crooks and they want to make money too, but they want the high, their main objective is the skim. 
and they need high rollers and affluent people to feel comfortable <laughs> when they're in Las Vegas. And if those people aren't comfortable because they're getting burglarized and there's uh, street violence, you know, uh, drug dealing and shootings and things like that, that's not good for the I think for the long term uh, game, which is the skim. I think that the number that I, I'm remembering is before 1971. I think the previous. Uh, I, don't quote me on this, but this anecdote is 99% true. Uh, I think in the previous 10 years, or maybe it had been the previous 20 years, there had been five murders in Las Vegas. And in the first three years of Spilatro, <laughs> there was like 25. Yeah. Yeah, he was pretty So, pretty I mean, violent, you, yeah. you, you like tripled, quadrupled uh, the amount of hits in, in a very... Uh, short period of time. And it, the, the point being that he announced his presence with authority to use a, a line from, from Bull Durham. Um, you know, he showed up in town and he, he blew the doors off their hinges. And I think it was the Chicago bosses at first were like, Oh, you know, he's, he's feeling himself out there and <laughs> we'll let him, you know, get his footing. And, you know, it, I don't think it, I think they got a kick out of it to some degree at first, even though it annoyed them. It's like, oh, it's just Tony being Tony. And then the act started to wear thin really yeah. fast. Yeah. And uh, he wasn't sharing the money that he was making from all these outside rackets with the guys he was supposed to be sharing it with. Right. And by the so they don't want him to be doing it in the first place. But if he's gonna do it, you better, you better, better kick piece it. of us. You better, <laughs> you better give, a, give us up. a piece, right? Uh, right. And then you had a situation. You know, he's sleeping with Lefty Rosenthal's wife, which bothered everybody, and it's show it's shown in the in the movie. Um, but he didn't. It, they make it seem like in the movie that Lefty Rosenthal or Ace Rostein is blown up, and then immediately Spilatro is killed. Right, but there was four, there was four years. Uh, Spilatro lasted for four years after the 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 car bombing attack on Rosenthal and the whole Rosenthal Spilatro Rosenthal uh, wife uh, love triangle. So that it was another four years, and it, I think within those four years, my point is that didn't get him killed. Right, what got him killed at the end of the day was a deluge of racketeering indictments that came down against all the biggest bosses in the Midwest that everybody pointed the finger directly at Spilatro for like all this heat that you've been bringing on us for 15 years has now come to a head and we're all looking at dying behind bars. Yeah. And yeah. this was alluded to in the movie, but I think, I don't think it was emphasized enough. Just like, I don't think the drugs were emphasized enough. He had every intention and by, by 1985, 86, Spilatro had every intention of killing his way to the top of the outfit. He yeah. wanted to get to, to rally loyalists and go knock off Joe Ferriola, Sam Carlisi, Johnny DeFranzo, and put his own people in Chicago and run everything from Vegas. Even though he was only a soldier at that point, right? right? I mean, he, he he practically was a he was captain, a crew but, he not was a crew boss. A, but not officially he a captain, officially even a though he, he sort of had that same yeah. status. Um. Yeah, and uh, what does he say in, in Casino? Uh, like, they think they're going to want to go to war? <laughs> what is he right. talking to Frankie? <laughs> he say, uh, you know, well, well, I don't know yet, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, uh, you know, go, go dig a hole. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, right. And then, and then go, I'm going to say, uh, uh, you know, go find the Jew and, and, and have him take you there. Yeah, then he says, uh, he's like something. He's like, he's like, did I say go now? I didn't say go now. <laughs> I didn't say. Uh, I got to think. I got to think, 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 think about his it. His mouth as he's. <laughs> he's like, yeah, Jigs and uh, Tony Gorilla says if uh, it's true, you're, you're screwed. <laughs> they get they earn with the prick. <laughs> yeah, of course they're protect, they earn Of course the they're prick. worried about. It. Yeah. <laughs> so and uh, um, and me being such a nerd, and I have no idea if this is true, but there was a guy named Johnny Apes. So I think when they said Tony, in my mind, when the character uh, Frank Marino says Tony Gorilla, I think they just changed the name and they were actually, it was actually a, a line about the real life Chicago mobster Johnny Apes. Yeah. Who was also kind of keeping tabs on Spilatro. And, all and so Spilatro thinks that he's going to a making ceremony for his brother. Right. And he thinks, he, and he thinks he's being uh, promoted to, to Capo regime. 
but and we we've talked to other people though on and off the record. Don't they think that he that he's still part of him suspected that this could go wrong? No, they did. They, uh, I think this he is, he wasn't naive about it. Right, right? he and, he thought that that this could this could go bad. Well, let's back up for one second. If that makes sense. Before we talk about his murder, let's talk about the last cold case homicide or missing persons that they're looking into. Yeah. Related to something that really had nothing to do with mob activity. It had to do with a cocktail waitress spilling a drink on Spilatro or one of Spilatro's entourage and Spilatro cursing her. Uh, I guess he called her a cunt. And uh, two days later, she vanished. Wow. Um, there are people that swear to the FBI that Spilatro got rid of her. There's no proof. There's no like. So do they know the gender on one of or one of those bodies is female that they found in Lake Mead, or they have an idea? They, they have an idea. But um, she, I guess she, she disappeared two days later, and it was it was covered in the in the news. It wasn't like uh, yeah. you know, a blip uh, on the radar or a small little blurb uh, at the end of uh, the last page of the paper. To people I talked to, this was like front page story. We're still trying to track down who what her name was. Well, he strikes me as a rogue enough person that it's some. It seems plausible. And it, that and it he took would do it took place like at that. Jubilation, which I mean, for, for most people might not care about this, but I'm I'm such a nerd. Uh, again, <laughs> trying to figure out if Tony Gurlow was Johnny Apes. It's, it's it's so innocuous; it doesn't matter. But uh, Jubilation for someone who I, I I love pop culture and history, and you know, Jubilation was the Studio Fifty Four of the West Coast, or at least of Las Vegas. Uh, in the uh, late seventies, early eighties, at the peak of the disco um, trend and and the nightclubbing Saturday Night Fever era, Jubilation was the hottest spot to go in Las Vegas. You know, all the celebrities, all of the high rollers, all of the mob guys would be every night at Jubilation, um, and it was right off the Strip uh, on Harmon Avenue, and uh, it was actually uh, partially owned by Paul Anka. Who uh, doesn't really resonate with people? Uh, he's, my not generation. Gang, he's not gangster at all. I'll right, tell Paul you that. Anka was um, uh, was like a crooner. It was like easy listening. Yeah, music. in like the sixties. Yeah, and I guess he was in the midst of some type of comeback. And uh, people forget that Jubilation was a, a Paul Anka uh, supported entity or whatever. People just talk about Jubilation being this this really hot spot uh, nightclub. But uh, it's kind of funny to, to again, it's hot spot, and, and you don't think of. Paul Anka as the, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm telling you, oh, in 1979, David Lee Roth opened up Jubilation yeah. in Vegas. Yeah. Like, oh, David Lee Roth, lead singer of, uh, of Van Halen. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, Paul Anka, I mean, at the time for like probably people who were in their 40s, 50s, 60s, he would have he would have been a bigger deal, you know. Um, uh, so, yeah. So that's when that that's where that took place. Um there is a scene or two in in uh, casino where they're at a club and the club is supposed to be a jubilation. But uh, so yes, yeah, Spilatro and his brother were called back to Chicago, uh, June 1986, and they're told that uh, Michael, his younger brother and protege, was going to be inducted into the outfit, and that Spilatro himself was being upped to Capo regime, and. Uh, they were lured to a, a a residence in Bensonville, which is uh, south, right? Like it's, it's like the first suburb you hit going south of of the Chicago proper. It actually actually might be a part of Chicago. I'm not positive. Um, and and he was, they were both killed, just like you saw in the movie, except it didn't take place in a cornfield. It happened in a basement, and they were beaten, strangled, stomped to death. And Tony was forced to watch his little brother uh, be murdered in front of him. And Tony also, according to uh, a, a future witness that was there, uh, asked his killers if he could uh, if he could say Hail Mary, uh, say a prayer. And they said, no. <laughs> We're rejecting that, uh, that motion. And another interesting aspect of it was... He had made so he had made so many people so angry that you know normally a mob hit gets um, ordered 
or greenlit, the guy that's ordering the mob hit is not going to be present at the mob hit, let alone other uh, administrators in that organization. But uh, with Spilatro, you had the entire sitting admin of the Chicago mob that wanted to be there to watch Spilatro be murdered. So it, it acted it kind of twofold. So Spilatro gets to the house and he sees all the bosses there. So he immediately lowers his guard because he's like, well, they're not going to kill me in front of all the yeah, bosses. They're not going right, to get their hands dirty like that. But they did. And I think to your point about what they knew or what they didn't know, I think a lot of people have uh, a lot of people have asked me this over the years. Um, if you know if you if you know you're going somewhere where you could be killed, why did you go? And I and I said I don't think you understand the life. I don't think you understand the code. Yeah. Um, Spilatro knew there was a very good chance that he wasn't coming back from that meeting, and he this is the life I've chosen, and if this is how I got to go out. This is how I'm going to go out. Yeah. He he wasn't gonna go on the lamb. You get sent for. He walk in. <laughs> right. You don't you don't walk. What does he say? Lefty. Right. right. And no, it's that, your best friend who does it. That's from. Well, I thought that was from uh, Gotti. No, I think it was. Uh, I think it's Donnie Brasco when he's oh, like, that, yeah, you get, lefty, you get yeah, sent yeah, for. Yeah, right. Yeah. He <laughs> walk in. You don't you don't walk out. And it's your best friend who does it. So so I think I, are we ready? I think yeah, we're we're, uh, we're up against the well, limit here. I think someone else has to get in the studio. We're gonna wrap it up, but uh, so. We'll keep you updated. You know, what we're hearing from some of the experts in, in Las Vegas, and I'm not talking about mob experts. I'm talking about, you know, experts in, in regards to, to nature and, and geology and, and water levels. Um, they're saying that they expect there could be another couple dozen bodies that emerge in the next year. Yeah. That the, the water level is going to keep dropping. It's going to drop another possibly three to four feet. And um, you're just going to keep on finding bodies. The the one thing that I heard recently from a, um, a guy that was representing the the like for uh, I don't know what, what you call it the state forest and nature preserve from Nevada. He was just like um, like DNR kind of yeah. Thing. He was saying this is the tip. He says, he's like be prepared, Las Vegas. This is the tip of the iceberg. Or whatever you, you haven't call seen it, any Department he, of Interior or whatever. He's they call saying it. that like these first five you haven't seen anything yet. You're going to keep on finding bodies. Uh, as the water level keeps dropping, so this is a this is a ongoing story, real time. Again, blending uh, old and new. Uh, we'll, we'll keep you updated if there's any more um, names that that emerge as potential victims. Again, Spilatro has been dead for you know since '86. Uh, I don't know if there are any really people alive that you could eventually charge for any of these. It's just I think I doubt it. You know, putting putting the um, putting those cases to bed and, and having the families uh, finally have some yeah. type of closure. Last thing I'll say is that there is a family out there that has nothing to do with the mob and their, their relative that they suspect could be one of these um, bodies or sets of remains had nothing to do with the mob. But uh, it's a, a longtime Las Vegas family whose dad or grandpa died in a boating accident. Or should that, say died. That disappeared. That disappeared in a boating accident that, in the fifties. That, that same thing can happen. So I mean, that that can happen. That's very very plausible. That some of these are not gang. Right. So if we related. have th if, if if at the end of the day, a year from now, we have thirty bodies. I don't think all thirty bodies are no, going to be tied to not. gangland activity. But I think there's a good chance that uh, a a percentage of them, a, a, a nice chunk of them, will. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Please follow us on social media. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Follow our new video channel on YouTube. And uh, I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. And Ben in the house. Thanks for listening. See you guys next time. <laughs>